husband and husband, I, I, or a wife and wife. I don't know which, how it works. Murume anurora murume wonzi baba na baba ameno kuti shi papa amai na amai. Yeah. What's the result? What what is be, the what is the cause of that? Chi chino kwanza leso. Why has the West gone that way? Ko waka waka si waka shuka pamoja mbe yoy. Tells us right here. They have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They are no longer worshipping the Creator. They have turned away from worshipping Him. Instead, they want to worship creatures. Even themselves. Okay? The result is these things. Okay? It talks here, if we go down, let's just go down to verse uh, 28. That is to give our 28. Just read verse 28. At wearing a verse 28. Pam Soro Peso says, I was in a good funga good is a good era, Kuvane Rosor, Amari, Akawaisa Kumuranga Rokura, Akawaisa Muranga Rokura Sika, Kutuaite, Sisaka Fanira. Once again, what is what do we see here? They did not want to retain the knowledge of God. So what does God do? He gives them over to a depraved mind. Do you know how, if I was to tell you, you will laugh. You see, people in the West no longer want to have the knowledge of God. Society there is rejecting the knowledge of God, saying we don't want it, we don't need it, it is rubbish. They're saying it, it's old-fashioned. It belongs to people that are simple, that don't have education. That's what they're saying. And you know what's happening? Their minds are becoming totally depraved. You know that now in the United States, and not just the United States, it's also in Britain, it's also, it's coming into Australia. They have what they call transgender. Alright, so this, this is what's happening now. A baby is born. Is it male or female? I think it's quite easy to tell, isn't it? But you know what they're saying? They're saying we mustn't tell our children what sex they are. We must leave them to decide for themselves. So we have boys saying, I want to be a girl. We have girls saying, I want to be a boy. It's a big debate over there right now. Do you see what happens when people turn away from God? And these are people with university degrees. They're not talking like this. You see, when we forsake the knowledge of God, things stop working properly in our minds and in our bodies. God didn't create a man to be attracted to a man or a woman to be attracted to a woman. But when we reject God, our bodies, our desires, everything begins to be affected. When we don't want the knowledge of God, then our minds don't work properly. That's why the world is in the state that it's in. That's why our society is in the state that it's in. That's why things are not working properly. That's why uh, there's misery. And hardship. That's why we look at the world and we shake our heads. Things don't work properly when people reject God 
and despise the knowledge of him. You see, because God created us to rule this world but through the wisdom that comes from God. He created us to rule the world the way he designed it to be ruled. But because our relationship with God has been broken, man no longer has the wisdom of God. We don't even understand what the wisdom of God is. And we are living by something we call wisdom. But actually it is not wisdom. It's foolishness. So what does it say here? Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Okay? So here are people calling themselves wise, saying they're wise, and yet God looks at them and says they're fools. You see, the wisdom of man is foolishness in the sight of God. And yet man looks at God's wisdom and says that's foolishness. You see, our minds have been twisted. Our understanding of what is really true and what is false has been twisted. Today people call things that are evil, they call them good. And things that are good, they call evil. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching Jesus Christ. There will always be people that say we are Satanists. Every crusade, I hear people saying they Satanists. Do you remember the Lord Jesus? What did they say about him? When he was ministering on the earth? That's right. They said of the Lord Jesus, he has a demon. He is operating by Satan's power. They said he's casting out he's casting out demons by Beelzebub. You see, Jesus was operating by the Spirit of God. But they were calling the Holy Spirit an evil spirit. And then they would call an evil spirit the Holy Spirit. Do you know that that's happening even here? It's happening right here. People will call an evil spirit the Holy Spirit. But they will call people that are preaching the gospel by the Holy Spirit Satanists. Do you see what has happened with man? We thought we were wise, but we became, we, we, we became fools. It, it tells me to become something means you weren't that from the beginning. Isn't it? If you become something, it means at one point you were not that. You see, when God created man, God didn't create man the way man is today. God didn't create man to be like an animal. Because that's how many people are, are like animals today. There's little difference between the beasts and the humans.
If you were at the crusade last year, I think you heard me preach about it a bit, isn't it? God never created people to live that way. He didn't create men to have a woman and then leave her and have another woman and leave her and have another woman. That's what dogs do. Is that the truth? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way dogs live. He, he didn't create woman to, to give her body to this man, then the next man, then the next man. Till the point where she has to prove whose child it is. God never created it that way. That's the way dogs live. Isn't it? You never know with a dog what kind of puppy it's going to produce. But it shouldn't be like that with humans. That's not the way God created us. But because we've rejected God, this depravity and this uh, perversion has grabbed a hold of us. Now, the reason that we're talking about this is because we need to understand what we are dealing with when we are preaching the gospel. If the root problem is the rejection of God, what is the solution? Repentance. And repentance means? Okay. And specifically, when you start in a new direction, what, is, what has man done? Man has turned away from who? From the true God. So this is what we're saying. This is the root sin. It is the sin that gives birth to all other sins. Alright? Are you getting me? And the root sin is man turning his back on God. No longer worshipping God. No longer wanting the knowledge of God. This is the root sin. So repentance is what? Turning to God. Okay, because remember repentance is 180 degree turnaround. Okay. So, people have turned away from God. Now they need to turn back to God. That is the solution. So, it's pointless to go to people that are not worshipping God, that are, have their own system of religion, that are doing their own things, worshipping created things, don't have a knowledge of God, it's pointless to go to them and say you need to stop sexual immorality. Because they are under its power. God has given them over to uncleanness in their hearts. They are slaves to sin. So let me let me let me ask you a question. Can you go to a dog and tell a dog to stop acting like a dog? Do you think you will be successful? Hmm? If you want a dog to stop acting like a dog, you have to change it from being a dog. 
kana wachida wati imbuga, irege kuita umbuga, wafana kutuwe shandra kutuwe irege kuwa imbuga. Isn't that right? And it's the same with people. Dosh mwache tene wan. You cannot come to people that are full of uncleanness in their hearts and are slaves to lust and say to them, stop committing sexual immorality. Because even if they come and down to the altar, when they leave and they suddenly with that woman, the lust in their heart will overpower them. That's what will happen. And you see, this is why if you read in the Bible, it says the law is powerless to save people. Why? Because the law cannot change the person. If someone's heart is full of adultery, what is he going to do? He's going to commit adultery. If someone's heart is full of anger, what is he going to do? He's going to murder, he's going to beat people, he's going to do things that are evil against other people. So what's the solution? There has to be a change of what's in here. There has to be salvation. That's what we're talking about when we're saying salvation. People have to be saved from their sin. And who can save them from their sin? Can they save themselves? Can a man say, All right, I will never look lustfully at a woman again? What happens? If there's lust in his heart, that's what's going to happen. You see? Because what's in the heart is what's going to control the life. You can't say to somebody that has lots of wickedness in their heart not to think wicked thoughts or not to talk wicked words because he might for a few minutes not be able to do it but within a very short period of time it will come out again you, you, you getting what I'm saying? if you have a, a container let's say a small drum and inside the drum is uh, rubbish, decaying things. You can put a lid on it. And the lid might suppress the smell a little bit. But as soon as that lid is lifted, that smell comes out. All right? Now that, that drum is just like the human heart. If it's full of wickedness and decaying things, we might be able to suppress it a little bit. But eventually that is all going to come out. So think about a drunkard. A drunkard comes home drunk, beats his wife because he's drunk. He wakes up the next morning and he's very sorry. I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. I'll never go back to that beer hall again. I tell you, my, I tell you, I tell you. It's finished now. Three days later. Or maybe one week later. Where, where is he going to be? at the bar doing it all over again doing it all over again and then he'll say to his wife again sorry sorry sorry, sorry. This, time, this time this time this time until eventually his wife is, leaves him and goes home you see so this is, this is the state of mankind 
If we're going to bring people to salvation, if we're going to see them saved from sexual immorality. If we're going to see them saved from all these things we've been reading about. What do we have to do first? When we're preaching to them, what do we have to aim at first? Extending life. Okay, exchanging, exchanging the lie for the truth. Yes, okay. We could say it this way. We have to turn them back to God, isn't it? So just, just go to Acts 26. I want to show you something here about Paul's, the, the, the mission that Paul was given by the Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus called Paul into, into the ministry, this is what he commissioned him to do. This is what he sent him to do. So Acts 26, are you there? Verse 17 and 18, if you can just read it. Verse 17 and 18, Acts 26. 26. Verse 17 18. Satani, Kunamari, Gamuchire, Okay. Now, let's just have a look at these two verses here. This is Jesus Christ sending Paul. He's giving him, he's saying, this is your ministry. This is what I am sending you to do. And notice he's sending him to the Jewish people and the Gentiles. Okay, just, we need to remember that not only Paul was not just sent to the Gentiles. And what does he send them to do? He sends them, first of all, he says, I'm sending you to open their eyes. That tells us something. What does it tell us? If Jesus, the Lord, is sending Paul to open their eyes, what does that tell us about their eyes? They are blind. They cannot see. Okay, so that's the first thing you've got to, we've got to realize. Humanity, mankind, is blind. We talked a bit about this. We can't see God. We can't perceive Him. Blinded to the truth. So the first thing the Lord says is, I'm sending you to open their eyes. So don't you think when we are going to preach the gospel, what do you think we need to pray for? That God will open their eyes. Because until God opens their eyes, they cannot see the truth. They are in darkness. They cannot see the light. Can a blind man see the light? You can have the sun shining in all its brightness. And you can take a blind man and put him right outside there and say, look at the sun. And he'll go up like this and he'll say, I can't see anything. All right. So the first thing that's got to happen is there, God has got to open their eyes. 
saka chekutanga chofana kuitika ndichikuti mwari anofana kuzarura meso avo but god opens eyes through us he said to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes. Because God uses words. He uses preachers. People talking about the truth, talking about Jesus Christ. To open people's eyes. Alright? So the first thing we see here, the whole world is in darkness because the whole world is blind. Have you ever tried to describe to a blind man how something looks, someone who's been born blind? Can you describe a tree to a person who has been born blind, he's never seen a tree. You say, it's got big branches. <laughs> they don't know what a branch is. You see, and this is sometimes the frustration that we have when we're preaching the gospel or we're ministering to people. Is we're trying to tell thing, them about things they've never seen. We're trying to describe something that they have never perceived. You know what I'm saying? And uh, eventually you run out of words. And the person still doesn't know. And the person still doesn't know. And the And the person still doesn't know. 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 And the person it's, it's impossible. It's a, you just can't do it. So, we need to be praying for God to open people's eyes because sometimes even people sitting in the church, they might be sitting in the church but they're not seeing. They might be listening to what you're saying, but they cannot understand it. And you wonder why their lives are never changing. You wonder why they can come Sunday after Sunday, listen to the word of God, and yet nothing changes. What do we need to start doing? Start to pray that God would open their eyes. Start to pray that God would open their eyes. Lord, let their eyes be opened. Because the moment someone's eyes are opened to the truth, their life will change. Look at the Apostle Paul. It's very interesting when you look at the story of the Apostle Paul. Are you familiar with the story of his conversion? You're all, you're all familiar with it? It's, it's recorded in Acts chapter 9. If you want to write it down, it's recorded. Paul is riding on a horse. And he is seeing physically. Okay? But his eyes spiritually are blind. He's going to arrest and persecute and even kill Christians. Okay? So, although he is seeing with his physical eyes, he is blinded spiritually. Hallelujah. Amen. Something happens. Jesus Christ appears to him. All right. Now, when Jesus Christ appears to the Apostle Paul, something happens to his physical eyes. What happens? He becomes physically blind. And he was blind for three days. Do you remember the story? But when he became physically blind, something else happened to his spiritual eyes. What happened? They were opened. There was an exchange that took place. He was riding with physical eyes that could see, spiritual eyes that couldn't. 
I fumbled my so I won up my name, but if I'm going to ask Jesus appears to him. Jesus no bazar za guari. And then he continues his journey to Damascus with his physical eyes closed, but his spiritual eyes open. No ba furamberi kwenda ku Damascus me so ake if I'm going to ask Aru ase pa name avarwa. His spiritual eyes were opened to realize who Jesus Christ is. And anybody whose eyes are opened will realize. And the moment somebody recognizes and realizes who Jesus is, their life will be changed forever. Paul was led by the hand into Damascus. And he sat in Damascus in darkness because of his blindness. For three days. He couldn't see a single thing in the world. But in here, all he could see was the glory of Jesus Christ that he had seen on the road. For three days, he looked at nothing but the vision he had seen of Jesus Christ. That's what happened to Paul. And he didn't eat anything. He was praying. His eyes had been opened. And a man who was persecuting the church was instantly changed to become somebody who would be the greatest builder of the church. What changed him? His spiritual eyes were opened. And he saw the glory of Jesus. Look at, look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. You'll see Paul talks about this because he experienced it. He knew what his problem was before he met Jesus. And he knew what the problem of the people in the world is. Let's just have a look at, let's start in verse 3. Uh, and I want to actually read through to verse 6. 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 Waka pofu mazwa ndanga roza wana mwari wenyika ino. Kutuwa rege kuona chieza chefangeri roku bunya kwa kristu. Ano wa mufana nizo wa mwari. Nekuta ati zipari zi isu. Asi jesu kristu sashe. Uye isu sawaranda wenyu nekuda kwa jesu. Nekuti mwaraka ati chieza nga chipenye murima. Aka itatu chieza chake chipenye mmoyo yedu. Kutitiwa ne chieza choru ziwo roku bunya kwa mwari mchiso cha kristu. Okay. Now, what is Paul talking about here? That's it, blindness. Not blindness with the physical eye, but a blindness that stops people being able to see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. A blindness that stops people being able to know and have the knowledge of the glory of God. Okay, so do you see what he's saying here? And notice what he says in verse 4. He says, who does he say has blinded them? The God of this world or the God of this age. Notice the word God. The God of this age. This world. What God is that talking about? <laughs> Satan. Satan. Remember what we said? The whole world is worshipping Satan. Satan. 
There may be different forms of it. Over here they may do it this way. Over here they may do it this way. But everyone that's not following and worshipping Jesus, they don't realize, realize it, but they are following Satan. Okay? So, the God of this age, remember I said Satan is behind all of this. Satan is behind mankind turning his back on God. Satan is behind man taking stones and wood and things like that and making things that he calls his God. You see, Satan has got leading men to create systems of religion. That worship him. And people don't even know it. People don't even realize that that is what they're doing. So that's why if somebody makes an idol, alright, they make an idol, and then they trust that idol, they worship that idol. Do you know it's Satan that they're actually worshiping? So when someone takes a stone and says in their heart, this stone is going to save me. The stone is going to protect me. The stone is going to keep me. Who are they actually saying that about? That's it. That's who they're saying it about. So Satan gives people things. He gives them things. And people take these things from him and set them up as their gods. You know witchcraft doesn't operate without things. Isn't that true? Witchcraft cannot operate without things. Because the way Satan works is he gives people created things to put in place of the Creator. He gives people created things to turn their eyes away from the Creator onto things that have been created. Alright, so we have all kinds of things. We have animals that become sacred animals to us. We won't eat that animal. That animal is held in reverence. Okay, so this is what Satan has done. False religions, they all originate with Satan. Jesus stands alone as the truth. So as hard as it might be for some people to hear, if they are not following Jesus Christ, they are following Satan. There's no in-between. Okay? So what is Satan's strategy? It's to blind people's minds Look at verse 4. Why does he want to blind their minds? So that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, 
who is the image of God will not shine on them. Satan's number one goal is to stop people seeing who Jesus is. Now, notice it says Jesus is the image of God. What does that tell you? If you want to see God, who do you look at? Jesus. Jesus. There's, there's another place in scripture which says he is the image of the invisible God. It's, it's Colossians chapter 1, I think, verse 16. Let's have a look there. Just keep your finger there in Corinthians because we're coming back. Colossians 1. And if you look, it's, it's verse 15 of Colossians 1. Yeah, verse 15. Just read that for us. Colossians 1, verse 15. 1, verse 15. Yeah. Okay, do you see that? Talking about Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. Alright, so how many of you have seen God? He's invisible, isn't it? No one has ever seen God. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, and can see God and live. So what has God done? God has sent his son Jesus Christ in the flesh. That means as a man to show us who he is. When we look at Jesus, we see God. When we listen to Jesus, we are listening to God. Okay? When we know Jesus Christ, we also know God. He is the image of the invisible God. What the devil wants to do is stop people seeing that. To stop people seeing who Jesus is. So people might say, ah, he's a good man. They haven't seen anything. They might say, ah, yeah, Jesus was a prophet. They haven't seen anything. If you remember, there was a time when Jesus' disciples they were with Jesus. It's, it's in Matthew 16 if you want to write it down. Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Who do the people say I am? Have you read this? Who do the people say I am? And so his disciples answer, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. And they were telling him all the things that people were saying about Jesus. Then Jesus turns and he says, sir, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And you know what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, you are blessed. Because flesh and blood did not show you this. My father in heaven showed you this. Okay. So what happened? God revealed who Jesus was to Peter. His eyes were opened. 
to see who Jesus Christ really is. And the when Peter saw who Jesus really was, his life was never the same again. You remember, I, as I was preaching, I told that story about Peter. When, the, when they caught those fish, Peter fell on his knees before Jesus. And he said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. At that moment, Peter's eyes began to open. There was an opening. Sight, spiritual sight came to him. He realized who is this man? I'm standing in the presence of the Lord. And his life was never the same. He left his boats. He left his nets. And he began to follow Jesus. Because he had seen who he is. Do you see the key? This is the key of salvation. Just go back where 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where we were. We see Satan is blinding people's minds to who Jesus is. We've seen that in verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And then in verse 5. Then by verse 5, Paul then says who, who he preaches is Jesus Christ. But look at verse 6. I say verse 6. Look at what he's saying. He's saying the same God that spoke in the beginning when there was darkness over the face of the earth and said let there be light and there was light light came into the darkness he says that's the same God who shone light into our darkness he wasn't talking about the light of the sun he was talking about the light of truth the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And where do we find the knowledge of the glory of God? In the face of Jesus Christ. There's only one way people can know God. They have to see Jesus for who he is. That's why if we want to save people, we have we have to preach one message. What is that message? The gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to preach Jesus. And when we preach again, we preach Jesus. And when we finish preaching about Jesus, we preach about Jesus. Alright, and when we wake up the next day, we preach about Jesus. Jesus. All right. Nothing else is going to save a single person. The name of your denomination. Your denomination will never save a single soul. Never. That's why we have denominations that are full of unsaved people. People can join a church like it's a club. They can they can weigh up in their minds. If I go to this church, I will get this, this, and this. If I go to this church, I get this, this, and this. My family's in this church here. So I don't want to come to this church here because my family's in this church here. You see, what people are looking at is they're just looking at church. And as long as people are just looking at church, there's no salvation. It's just like a club, a sports club. 
There is no difference. Uh, which, which, which club shall I join? Shall I join this football club or shall I join this one? I am I am Dynamos and he's Caps United and he is Highlanders. And that's how people look at church. That's not what saves people. If people are looking at a denomination, they're being blinded. They're being blinded. Because only Jesus Christ can save people. Who have people got to see? They, 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 we don't want them to see Zioja, AFM, UAFC, Assemblies of God. We don't want them to see that. What we Jesus. We want them to see that they are followers of Jesus Christ. Not a member of Zioja or a member of Ioja or a member of this or a member of that. We want them to see it's Jesus. So that one, and it's about Jesus from the beginning yes. to the end. Yes. You see, one of the names of Jesus is Alpha and Omega. What does Alpha mean? What does it stand for? The beginning. What does Omega stand for? The end. All right, it comes from the Greek alphabet. No, alphabet Greek. The Greek alphabet, the first letter is alpha and the last letter is omega. In our alphabet, the one we use, we are saying Jesus is the A and Jesus is the Z. All right, from beginning to end, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, if we don't have that kind of mind, we'll never save anybody. Oh, we, we might bring someone to our church, but we'll never save them. There will still be unsaved people sitting in our church. Uh, they may come, they may even have a Bible. But unless people have come to the place where they see who Jesus is and they believe the gospel in the very depths of their hearts they are not saved and you will see it in their lives as we've traveled around we've been in all kinds of churches we've come across people that have been in church 20 years yet they're demon possessed they come and a demon manifests we cast the demon out we say to them what church are you from? I'm from AFM, I'm from this church, I'm from that church. How long have you been? In the church? 20 years? 20 years. With the demon? Ne demon. Powerful demon. And then we wonder why in the church things are not going well. People are fighting each other. People are splitting the church. Causing division, causing confusion. <laughs> I tell you, you see, the key to salvation. Pastor quoted it today. Just look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. 
and verse 9. So verse 9. Is it, have you got any time? Are you finished with time? Okay, let me just finish this verse, then we'll have a break. All right, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Just, just read that. If the first thing he says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. So how can someone be declaring that Jesus is Lord if they've never really seen who he is? You see, Peter declared that 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 day on the boat. He fell on his knees and he said, Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. There was another time when, after Jesus' resurrection, this man, one of his apostles, one of his disciples, by the name of Thomas, he watched Jesus being crucified. And he saw him breathe his last breath. Give up his spirit. And he saw them take his dead body off the cross. And put it in the tomb. And they saw the stone get rolled in front of that tomb. And Thomas thought it was all over. Because he still hadn't really seen who Jesus is. If he had really seen who Jesus is, he would have known death has no power over him. But he hadn't. What he had be begun to believe about Jesus was taken from his heart when he saw Jesus die. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appears to the other apostles and Thomas was not there. He was out somewhere. And when he comes back, he says, they, they tell him, we have seen the Lord. He is alive. It's true. He has risen from the dead. What did Thomas say? Thomas said, I will not believe that unless I put my fingers in the holes in his hands and in his side. And as he said that, Jesus appeared. And Jesus looks right at Thomas. And he says, Thomas, put your fingers in my hands. Yeah, put your finger where the spear went. Look, put your finger where the nails went to my feet. And Thomas, Thomas, his eyes were opened. What did he say? He fell on his knees and he said, My Lord and my God. He confessed Jesus is Lord. Because he saw who Jesus really is. This is the key to salvation. And so God sent Paul. First thing is to open people's eyes so they can see who Jesus really 
Chekutanga kuta zare mesewa nukutiva kuona kuti Jesu ndia ni chaie. What was the second thing that he sent Paul to do? Kwa chechi piri cha katumira Paul kutaiti ndechepi. Let's have a break. Gati mbuzurura. And we'll come back and look at it. Sia zoka to zitarisa. Okay, so you can... We, you can just go to Acts 26 and when we come back we'll have a look at it. But just look at it. You can look at it if you want during the break and we'll discuss it. But stand up and just stretch your legs.